All these gains are in their head because they imagine how much they have claim to. Um, but that all changes in the end. Um, the, the dollars that they have don't have claim to much anymore. But something does, right? When the dollar loses its claim on goods, by definition, all the all that purchasing power goes into what the dollar is a derivative of. It goes yeah. down the derivative chain. Prices for commodity producers, oil and gas producers, base metals producers, and in particular, gold and silver producers, uh, suggests that those commodities are headed lower in price. If that conjecture is incorrect, if that widely held precept is wrong, there are superb uh, opportunities in the resource space. The disparity between commodity prices and the resultant free cash flow to commodity producers and the equity prices, uh, the market capitalizations commanded by those producers, is as broad as I have seen it in a 50-year career. In today's show, two financial experts, Rafi Farber and Rick Rule, will talk about the commodities landscape and do a deep dive into the key catalyst for gold and silver as the banking system continues to struggle. We'll show you the best clips of the latest interview of Rafi and Rule tying everything up with the latest market news in gold and silver. If you want to understand how the current debt crisis and the looming America recession affect gold and silver, this video is for you. Like subscribe to the channel and share it if you want to support the channel. Let's get into the video. He had an interview where he was where Powell just said openly, yeah, some small banks are going to have to close or be merged out of existence and their assets and their deposits are going to be bigger banks. So yeah, this is going to happen. Um uh you know, the but the big banks are going to have a problem too when there are no more dollars left to circulate uh, with given the amount of debt load and they have to print more. Uh, so what's going to be the time lag from the time where the next batch of small banks are going to be, are going to go out of existence. And when the real, when the first big bank really starts to fall, I guess I would look at uh, Wells Fargo. I think Wells Fargo is the weakest of the really big banks. So when that one starts to really fall, um, then that could take down other big banks too. Uh, but I think the first big bank to fall is going to be Wells Fargo. Might be wrong on that, but uh, that's my feeling. Um, it's the, the people that don't brag about their winnings. Maybe they liquidated into dollars, but nobody's liquidating into gold. So mm. you, you, it, it's, it's mostly all these gains are in their head because they imagine how much they have claim to. Um, but that all changes in the end. Um, the, the dollars that they have don't have claim to much anymore. But something does, right? When the dollar loses its claim on goods, by definition, all the all that purchasing power goes into what the dollar is a derivative of. It goes yeah. down the derivative chain. Prove their worth in an inflationary time that this would have to do with resources. My uh, postulation, Mike, is that if we don't, and I'm not saying we won't, if we don't have a really, truly severe worldwide synchronized global recession, uh, that... Uh, a broad spread shortage in commodities will develop sooner rather than later. If we yeah. do have a recession, it'll be postponed, not eliminated. If that's true, that means that extractive industry prices uh, across the board will go higher. And that's very interesting because the equity, no mistake, uh, I'm one of those who's surprised. I'm just surprised in the other direction. Uh, I'm surprised that it's held together so well for so, so long. I'm in a little community in Northwest Washington, and there is a genuine labor shortage because we're in a place where the starting wage for a trainee at Safeway is $20 an hour. You know, wow. it's, a, it's a fairly strong economy. I'm also, however, uh, painfully aware of the bad arithmetic uh, around the federal budget. I'm aware of the fact that we have $34 trillion in unbalance sheet liabilities and $120 trillion, trillion dollars in off-balance sheet liabilities, Medicare, Medicaid, military pensions, Social Security Trust Fund, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and we service this with a debt, with a with a budget that's in deficit $2 trillion a year. The gold market remains resilient, holding above $2,000 an ounce despite ongoing pressures buoyed by steady U.S. consumer sentiment hovering near multi-year highs. On Friday, the University of Michigan reported a slight uptick in its preliminary consumer sentiment index to 79.6, marginally higher than January 79.0 reading.
This aligns closely with economists' expectations who anticipated a reading around 80. Joanne Hsu, director of consumer survey at the university, noted the fact that sentiment remained stable this month suggests continued consumer confidence in the economy, reflecting significant improvements seen in December and January across various economic sectors. Consumers maintain optimism regarding the easing inflation and robust labor market conditions. Meanwhile, inflation expectations have remained relatively steady, with consumers foreseeing a 3% increase by this time next year, just slightly above January's 2.9% projection. Long-term inflation expectations have also held steady at 2.9% for the past three months, within a narrow range of 2.9 to 3. 1% for the majority of the last 31 months, indicating sustained elevation compared to pre-pandemic levels. Despite this economic data, the gold market shows minimal reaction. April gold futures are currently trading at $2,090 an ounce, down 0.20% for the day. Now we'll show you with more clips of Rick Rule, but first hit the like button, smash the subscribe button. Also check our description as buy is giving you free 20 USD just for creating an account so you can start adding crypto to your commodities portfolio today. Now let's get back with gold and silver. Enjoy the video. So on the one hand, when I talk to people I know, when I look at my community, certainly when I read the mainstream financial press, all is good. All is good. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. Uh, and they're going to be able to cut interest rates. Uh, when I look at the arithmetic, then it's not so good. Uh, I get scared. Right. Uh, I guess what served me well in life, Mike, in, in, ret in, in reflection, is that I'm a perennial optimist who's always scared. <laughs> 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 I've got a little yeah. bit of both. You know, the fact that I'm a banker uh, means I'm not looking for unbridled upside. I'm always looking to cover my downside <laughs> at some point in time. One more point yeah. before we move on, Mike. We've talked about this on your show before, but there may be some listeners who haven't listened to prior shows. The way the big thinkers calculate inflation really tees me off. The CPI, which they have sold to your listeners as a cost of living index, is not. It's a constructed index. It's so-called hedonistically adjusted, which is to say they decide what your home is worth, not what the market says. They decide what your computer's worth. And probably more challenging, when it's inconvenient for them, they don't add food or fuel. <clears throat> right. I like to fly and I like to eat. So that doesn't reflect the basket of goods and services I consume. But more concerning to that is that the CPI doesn't include tax. And tax as a component of your listeners' cost of living is more important than shelter, energy, transportation, or food combined. Yeah. The idea that the CPI purports to be a cost of living index, purports to measure the deterioration of the purchasing power of wages and savings is a fraud. And I think people need to look at that. I'm not saying that people need to be scared. Go huddle in the corner, wrap up in a blanket, buy seven guns and go to gold. I'm not saying that, although a little bit of gold would be prudent. What I am saying is that they need to temper the unbridled optimism that they see on CNN or, or, or read in the Wall Street Journal. So um, one of the arguments that the Bitcoin people like to make is that Bitcoin can't be inflated, right? Yeah. Um, and one of the counter arguments that, that our side makes is, well, there's all kinds of different cryptocurrencies. Anyone can just invent a new one. It's really the same thing. And they'll say, no, Bitcoin is special because there's only one Bitcoin and yeah. the rest of just Bitcoins or whatever they like to call them. Uh, but there is another, like, it, it's not that the infl inflation is inflation of, like, really, when, when, the, when the dollar is printed, it's printed as a gold derivative, right? So it's not the dollar that's inflating. It's you're, 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 you're pretending that the gold supply is higher than it is by printing a receipt for gold, which is the inflation. So... For Bitcoin, the inflation of Bitcoin would be, um, you know, an ETF 
in Bitcoin that might not be backed by it one by one, one for one, or um, futures on an ETF on Bitcoin, or options on those futures on the Bitcoin, and you have all these Bitcoin derivatives. And that's that leads to the inflation of Bitcoin because people trade the Bitcoin ETF instead of Bitcoin itself. So that's where inflation really comes from. It's it's the inflation of the derivatives. You can't inflate money itself. You can inflate derivatives. What do you think of today's episode? Do you agree with Rafi Farber and Rick Rule on their macroeconomic take? Do you feel secure with your money at a bank account? Post in the comments section down below your insights on the video, especially if you'd feel safer having crypto than money in your bank account. Thanks for watching it to the end. Take advantage of the massive sign up bonuses to get crypto if you have not yet done so. Subscribe to the channel and check this upcoming video because you'll love it. I see you on the other side.